We got, do we got a, let me get my view together, gallery view. Oh, it's live. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to the House Economic Matters Committee. Today is Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021. I believe we have four Senate bills before us today. Uh, the first of which, uh, Senate Bill 307, uh, Ms. Ashley Taylor, I am told, will be presenting on behalf of Chairman Gazone. Uh, is Miss? I see you. Uh, welcome, Miss Taylor. Hello, Chairman Davis. Uh, and good afternoon, Chairman Davis and committee members. Um, my name is Ashley Taylor. I am from Senator Guzzoni's office and here representing him today to introduce Senate Bill 307, Labor and Employment, Direct Care Workforce Innovation Program. So this bill addresses the critical shortage in direct care workers and the necessary support for nonprofit organizations, including labor organizations or employers of direct care workers as it pertains to the training, recruitment and retention of frontline workers. Ranging from certified nursing assistants, geriatric nursing assistants to home health and psychiatric aids, the state has seen a continued decrease in the availability of these personnel. And the pandemic has accelerated the drop in actual numbers of needed workers. Over the past year, there has been serious erosion of the number of frontline workers caused in part by their limited access to testing and PPE and their ability to get to and from work. Now with this bill each year beginning in fiscal year 2022, grant support in the amount of 250,000 will be made available to an eligible organization on a matching basis. Uh, individual awards, however, may not exceed 50,000. The program's goal is to encourage and support innovative and new approaches to training, recruitment, and retention programs. And very importantly, attention will be given in the program to assuring an equitable geographic and demographic diversity. The program will be administered by the Division of Workforce Development and Adult Learning with the Maryland Department of Labor an organization that is well prepared to integrate this important addition to its workforce development and training toolkit. Uh, this bill would set the foundation for the state of Maryland to close the shortfall in the availability of frontline direct care workers, an issue that has frankly been overlooked for far too long. Now this bill passed in the Senate last year. Um, however, it did not have an opportunity to prog progress in the House due to the legislative session ending early. Um, but this year, uh, the bill has passed unanimously in budget and tax, finance, as well as the Senate floor. So we thank you for your consideration of this legislation and we urge a favorable report. Thank you very much. Um, are there, any questions for Ms. Taylor? Seeing none, hearing none. Um, let me check, see if there's any on the witness list. Uh, yes, we do, we have a few. Uh, is Ron Carlson available? Yes, he is, he's here. Uh, Mr. Carlson? Yes, sir, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, to say a couple of words about the importance of this piece of legislation. We were hoping that it would uh, pass through the, uh, the General Assembly last year, but because of the shortened session, that didn't happen. I serve as the Executive Director of the Maryland Regional Direct Services Collaborative, which represents uh, organizations uh, across the professional uh, sectors of, uh, of Maryland, uh, re representing the educational community, uh, they provide a membership community, which is uh, all the long-term care organizations and, and some of the public sector organizations. Uh, for the last three years, we've been diligent at, at working at one of, the, one of the most overlooked problems, I suspect, uh, in, in the healthcare arena. And that is the, uh, the shortage of the, avail of the, uh, the frontline direct services workers. These are the certified nursing assistants, the home care 
workers, the personal care aides, the psychiatric nursing assistants, and the psychiatric aides. Um, we've um, uh, uh, grappled with this problem, and I think that we're making measurable success in terms of elevating the importance that uh, uh, that uh, increasingly people are paying attention to the necessity of these workers. Uh, the the uh, the enormity of the shortfall is uh, uh, is is at a crisis stage. Uh, uh, not only are we seeing that in home care and in community-based settings, but we're we're seeing it also uh, with long-term care organizations of facilities themselves. What is so, so terribly, terribly important is that we, we do some aggressive things to assure the availability of the support that's needed in training, recruitment, and retention. Uh, again, this is an area that's been long overlooked, uh, and I think the pandemic has underscored the importance that we place uh, some uh, attention and, and put some money to work uh, to enhance the uh, recruitment and retention of these workers. We think that uh, this piece of legislation will begin to do that. Uh, we have a webinar that's uh, by coincidence uh, scheduled for Thursday of this week uh, that will bring some of that innovation and new thinking to the fore. Uh, we invite uh, people to the extent that you can uh, to be part of that webinar that will run between uh, 10 and 11 o'clock on Thursday. Uh, so we're, uh, we're hopeful that uh, uh, favorable action will be taken on this piece of legislation. Uh, again, we think it's incredibly important. Uh, we, uh, we think these kinds of incentives uh, to, some, uh, to stimulate some new thinking and innovation are critically important. Um, so uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to say a few words in, uh, in favor of this piece of legislation. Are there any questions? Any questions? If not, thank you very much. Um, that was the only witness that signed up to provide oral testimony. Um, tell you what, we're gonna run through the, uh, another quick one, a departmental, uh, then we'll go to Senator Cassidy and we'll close out with Senator Kramer. Um, let's go to Senate Bill 141. Uh, Gregory Morgan, I believe, will be presenting on behalf of the Department of Labor, Division of Occupational and Professional Licensing. You know, on mute there. Good afternoon, Chairman Davis, Madam Vice Chair Dumay, and members of this committee. I'm Greg Morgan, and I serve as Commissioner of the Division of Occupational Professional Licensing within the Maryland Department of Labor. Joining me today is Sinead Jordan, who serves as Executive Director of the Maryland State Board of Public Accountancy. We appear before you today to ask for your support in the passage of Senate Bill 141, which is uh, presented to update correct obsolete references to two educational institution accrediting bodies. The first organization, formerly known as the American Assembly of Collegiate Schools of Business, has changed its name and should be recorded in the statute as the Association to Advance Collegiate Schools of Business. The second organization, founded as the Association of Collegiate Business Schools and Programs, has changed its name and should be recorded in the statute to reflect the change to Accreditation Council for Business Schools and Programs. It is important that the existing statute be corrected to reflect the accurate names of these two accrediting institutions to avoid confusion among candidates for licensure within the Maryland State Board of Public Accountancy. We have been advised that uh, we cannot change these names in the annual corrective bill since it may not be clear and well understood. For these reasons, uh, we request a favorable report. Well, Ms. Jordan and I are here today uh, to welcome any questions from the committee. And again, thank you for allowing time to present. Are there any questions of Mr. Morgan? Anyone? If not, that concludes our hearing on Senate Bill 141. I'd now like to go to Senate Bill 610 with Senator Castley. Chairman Davis, uh, Vice Chair Dumay, oh. distinguished members of the, of the committee, Senator Bob Cassidy on Senate Bill 610. Um, la last year, you all passed a bill uh, that I had sponsored dealing with bed heights in hotel rooms, and that 
it was uh, done with a, put through with an agreement by the industry to comply. And they had a series of, of there was a schedule in that bill that uh, provided for replacement of beds with to increase the height to allow for, in handicap rooms. Um, that that uh, agreement was based upon the assumption that the hotel industry would continue to have a banner, another banner year. Unfortunately, COVID hit and the hotel industry was seriously impacted, as you all know. So all this bill says is, and this is introduced at the request of the industry, asked if I would introduce this. All it says is, um, look, we're going to give them an extra year that, that the, the deal they struck with, with us last year uh, didn't anticipate COVID. So we're just at their request, this would just say, hey, you guys get another year added on to, uh, to, to, to make all these changes in the bed heights. That's it, real simple bill. Uh, for the benefit of the industry, I, I would just uh, request that you all uh, report the bill out favorably. Thank you. Any questions of Senator Cassily? Seeing none. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, very much. Have a good day. You too, sir. That concludes our hearing for Senate Bill 610. I'd now like to welcome back an old committee member for Senate Bill 103. I uh, haven't seen him in quite some time. Senator Kramer, welcome Senator Kramer. Is Senator Kramer with us? Let me we are trying to contact him. Hey, right. Mr. Chair, I'm actually sitting in um, finance waiting for a bill hearing there, and he does not look like he's on ours. Uh, he just got up and walked away. So, Okay, maybe he's about to join us now. He's coming, Mr. Chairman. Now, what a horrible entrance after a great introduction. <laughs> hey, come here for a second, Kay. Test you. Oh my God. It's always the back end. And it just like Senator Kramer to just bring it to a complete halt. Just got, got all of us waiting. How you doing, Ms. Radoff? Doing very well, uh, Chairman. Lovely to see you again. It, last time I was here um, with, it was in 2018 with uh, then Speaker Bush of Blessed Memory for the same bill or similar, similar, similar topic. I recall. How are you? I'm doing well, doing well. Like people back home are wondering why we're just holding conversations and, and, and so forth. We're gonna blame, we're gonna blame, uh, there he is. How are you, Senator? Um, very you for asking, Mr. Chairman, but you're very thoughtful like that. <laughs> thank you for asking. The floor is yours, sir. All righty then. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the Economic Matters Committee. Um, Always a pleasure to visit with Economic Matters. Ben Kramer here to introduce uh, Senate Bill 103. Um, colleagues, this is the second part to two pieces of legislation to uh, protect Maryland consumers from the puppy mill industry and the products that they produce. Um, I just turned, tuned in and I heard the chair and Ms. Radoff uh, discussing the bill from 2018. And that bill was heard in this committee and passed overwhelmingly. 
Um, and what that bill did was address the first prong of how the puppy mill industry gets their products to the marketplace. And that's retail pet stores. Um, retail pet stores uh, purchase exclusively from puppy mill products and they are the mechanism, one of the two big prongs by which, uh, you know, the puppy mills survive. Um, in 2018, this committee in its wisdom uh, voted to stop the sale of puppies and kittens in retail pet stores in our state. Um, and we joined California and now several others who have taken the same step because there is a greater understanding that dogs and cats, our companion animals, have evolved alongside of humans. And in fact, there is science that shows that dogs crave the companionship of humans more so than they do of other dogs because they have evolved so closely with, with us. And the fact of the matter is puppy mills are just an abhorrent, horrible, nasty mechanism for mass production of companion animals puppies and kittens. And this committee said, we're going to take a stand and we're not going to allow them to sell into the Maryland marketplace through our retail pet stores. The second part or the second prong that I made reference to is through brokers. Now, historically, the puppy mill brokers were sort of the middle people. You had the retail pet stores, you had the puppy mills, and when the stores historically needed to uh, get inventory, they would go to a broker and they would say to the broker, and these brokers deal with thousands of puppy mills, and they would say, look, I need three golden retrievers, two collies and a German shepherd dog. And the brokers go out and contract with the puppy mills, find the inventory, and then it's shipped to the retail pet store. Now, what the brokers have learned is that with the internet, they can market for the puppy mills online. And so they set up elaborate websites with hundreds, thousands of photographs of adorable little puppies and little, you know, woven baskets with pretty little bows on. And they sell the puppy mill product through these websites. So this is really the second major prong for getting puppy mill inventory to the marketplace. So the bill before you now addresses that piece of it. The retail pet stores, we put in place in 2018 a prohibition on their selling puppies and kittens. The bill before you, Senate Bill 103, would now prohibit brokers from selling into the state of Maryland. Now, Puppy Spot is here today in opposition to this bill. Obviously, this cuts into their marketplace. Puppy Spot is one of the largest brokers in the nation, if not the largest. Um, they have acknowledged that they deal with thousands of sources, puppy mills, for getting their products. And I, you know, without going into great depth, because, you know, don't take my word for this. All you have to do is Google Puppy Spot and Better Business Bureau or Puppy Spot and Problems, and you will see the hundreds of complaints from people who have purchased puppies thinking they were going to get this cute little fuzzy healthy puppy 
Um, and what actually happens is Puppy Spot is an operation of sales based people who get commissions for selling puppies. So if you click on Puppy Spot and you call them, you're talking to somebody who's getting a commission. And what do they want to do? They want to sell you a puppy and they're going to push you hard to buy that puppy. When you do purchase the puppy, what happens is Puppy Spot then contacts the puppy mill where this puppy is, you know, being stored in a cage. And then they direct that puppy mill to ship the puppy directly to the purchaser. The puppy spot, going back to, because they're, they're here today in opposition, um, I'm just going to read two, because I, yeah, but, but like I said, don't take my word for it. This isn't just a random couple. There are going to be hundreds of these if you look into it yourselves. But here's a couple of complaints and very recent ones about Puppy Spot. My dog is inbred and has Von Willebrand's disease with a clotting factor of 16%. She needs treatment and Puppy Spot is not returning my emails. I purchased my Doberman Pinscher female for $3,295. Upon receiving her pedigree, I discovered that her mother and father's lineage share three ancestors, meaning her line has been inbred multiple times. I called Puppy Spot and they never got back to me. I haven't heard from anybody at Puppy Spot despite following up several times. And I'll just read one more real fast. Don't buy your puppy here. Our puppy arrived so sick. They guarantee the puppy's health and have refused to pay our vet bills. Um, the puppy had a severe ear infection and an extremely contagious parasite that transferred to myself and it's dangerous for children. The puppy had to get two rounds of meds for over a month and we had to fumigate the entire house. We've been going back and forth with them since we got him in November. They never call you back. We paid $4,500 for our puppy. We will never see that money again. Never mind everything we have forked over to the vets. They don't reply to emails or calls. So you may ask yourselves, how is it that this company, Puppy Spot, and the others that are similar don't have to respond or take any action? Well, I don't know whether you can see this, and I'll show it to you, but if you scan their website and you have to look really, really hard and start going into subcategories of other categories on their website, you can actually find their warranty page. And what does their warranty page say? No warranties. And like I said, don't take my word for it. Feel free to look it up. But here's what their warranty page reads. No warranties. Puppy Spot disclaims any and all implied warranties of merchantability and fitness. Now, mind you, we're talking about animals here, and they are disclaiming any and all implied warranties of merchantability and fitness. Puppy Spot further specifically disclaims any liability related to the appearance, temperament, personality, size, weight, color, compatibility with breed standards, or DNA test results of any puppy. So what they're saying is, you may have ordered a boxer and you've received a pug because it doesn't matter what the DNA test results show, there's no warranty. No way, no how. 
So quite frankly, the bill before you will protect Maryland consumers from this company and the others that operate the same way as brokers. Now the bill does provide for clarification and this was a concern that was brought to me last year by the American Kennel Club. They wanted it made clear that the kennels, for instance, that are here in Maryland or anywhere else that are responsible breeders can continue to operate. And I'm fully supportive of that. That's what the purpose of this bill is. So the bill also includes language that reads, um, a, the, the prohibition does not include an establishment at which the animals sold at the establishment were born at the establishment and a completed sale, transfer, or disposition of a cat or dog is conducted in person with both parties physically present at the same location. So what that encompasses is that the legitimate breeders, the quality breeders, the ones that operate the upstanding kennels um, around the country, it doesn't matter if it's in Maryland or elsewhere, the way they do business is that they won't sell a puppy to someone they have not met. They want you to come out. They want you to see the breeding dogs. They want you to see the, the dam and the sire, and they want you to see the conditions and they wanna meet you. They wanna make sure that one of their puppies is going to a good home. They will never sell you a puppy either online or over the phone, put it in a crate and ship it across the country, either in a truck or in an airplane and uh, a sight unseen. It's not the way they do business, it's the way the puppy mills do business. So the purpose of the bill is to ensure that Maryland consumers are protected and that we are also protecting our companion animals, our fur babies. The notion of the breeding dogs being stacked up in cages, and by the way, the only thing the law requires as far as the size of these cages is that they be big enough for the breeding dog to stand up and turn around. That's the requirement. And some of these puppy mills have hundreds and even thousands of dogs stacked in filthy cages without getting any veterinary care, without getting proper nutrients, food, water, physical exercise. It is brutal. And it is time in the 21st century that we take action to number one, not, no longer facilitate this kind of an operation, but to protect our consumers from the unhealthy animals that come out of these puppy mills. Now the folks at Puppy Spot are gonna tell you, well, we have a health guarantee and we only contract with upscale operations. The fact of the matter is Puppy Spot is a broker and the brokers do business with the puppy mill industry. And as I told you with their warranty is no warranty, so much for their health guarantee. And that's why if you go online to the Better Business Bureau and Google Puppy Spot, you will find hundreds of complaints on that site and many other sites. Now also Puppy Spot's gonna say, but look at our site. We've got all of these happy people on our site, you know, with testimonials about how thrilled they are. And my point to you all is look outside of their own site to find what's fact and what's fiction. Now, one other thing that's of note 
is that I understand, I just learned, and they showed up at the finance hearing, there are still a couple of retail pet stores that are disobeying the law and continue to sell puppies and kittens in their retail pet stores. And they showed up at the finance hearing on this bill to which the attorney general the following day sent a letter to every member of the finance committee saying, uh, and, and the two of them uh, today, I believe you're gonna hear from Just Puppies as well as Charm City Puppies, two retail pet stores that are now prohibited from selling puppies and kittens, but they continue to do so and the attorney general's office is going into court. And so the attorney general's office following testimony from just puppies at the uh, Senate hearing on this bill sent this letter saying, just puppies is currently the subject of an action brought by the Consumer Protection Division before the circuit court for Montgomery County. Um, and the reason for that is that they continue to operate and the attorney general also made a point of sending a copy of a letter from the city of Rockville dated September 18th, 2020, indicating that just puppies, because they operate there and in Towson, I believe, um, that their license is now void because they are operating uh, in violation of state law. And the attorney general sent us a copy of this a letter from the city of Rockville that says, this letter serves as formal, formal notification that the pet shop licensed is void. If Just Puppies is engaged in selling, transferring or disposing of dogs, Just Puppies must immediately assist and desist that activity. Yet, as I've looked at the testimony for today's hearing, colleagues, it appears that Charm City and Just Puppies, don't ask me why, they're still, the, the battle for them is over. The state made the decision in 2018 that they were no longer going to sell their puppy milk products. And in fact, at the hearing in economic matters on that bill, there was quite a bit of testimony from former employees of Just Puppies who I believe is gonna be here for, before you all today. And those former employees talked about the egregious and disgusting conditions at Just Puppies and how those puppies were mistreated, mishandled, and were very often sick and dying. So with that, um, I would uh, share with you colleagues, the bill passed again this year overwhelmingly in the Senate both in committee and on the floor. Uh, the committee heard this bill last year and I thank you all for passing it overwhelmingly last year. It did run out of time before getting uh, across to third reading, but I would welcome the opportunity to answer any questions you may have while I'm here. Um, this bill has strong support uh, the only opposition, of course, is from the industry that profits off the sale of puppy mill products. And, uh, but I welcome any questions. And, and again, you'll notice that no small breeder, no responsible breeder has sent you written opposition or is providing oral opposition. We are talking these big out of state breeders who sell by the thousands that are here in opposition. There isn't a single one of all, and there are hundreds of breeders here in Maryland and elsewhere across the country. None of those small breeders are opposing this bill because they're the ones that are doing the right thing. And they're the ones that we want consumers going to not the puppy mills. So uh, please, I welcome any questions. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your indulgence and the time. You're muted, no Mr. Problem. Chairman. 
Uh, I see Delegate Adams has a question. So we'll start with Delegate Adams. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Senator Kramer, good to see you. Uh, miss, miss the days in the House of Delegates when you were with us. Um, so, so the question is, I, I'm a consumer. Where, if this bill were to pass, does Chris Adams go to buy a puppy? Chris Adams can buy a puppy from any of the hundreds of responsible breeders that exist not just in Maryland, but across the country. Um, I know somebody who recently went to a responsible breeder, not a puppy mill, and, and the puppy mills are never going to let you see their operations. They do not want you to see the stacks of sick and ailing dogs and cats that are breeding the cute little puppies and kittens that they're selling, but the responsible breeders, and I st started to say, I know someone who recently went to Pennsylvania because they were looking for a particular breed and they found a breeder they loved up there. And the breeder said, come on up, make an appointment. We're gonna show you the breeding dogs. Um, you know, we've got a litter, feel free to pick a puppy and we want to meet you, but we've got hundreds of those in, in Maryland and those, you know, operations are not part of this bill. This deals with the, uh, the out of state massive, uh, corporations that are just literally by the thousands turning over puppies every year and sourcing through the puppy mills. But so the, the, so the reasonable breeders um, are, are the, still intact. All right, yeah, so the, the reason why I asked the question is, uh, you know, it's easy for me or you to get in a car and go to Pennsylvania, but for example, I, I like corgis. I've got a Welsh, you know, corgi. I, I actually think I could go to Pennsylvania and buy a, uh, a corgi, they're about $1,200, $1,500. And uh, I mean, that, that's a privilege that I have because I can get in a car and afford to go. What do you say to folks that, especially during a pandemic, I mean, uh, you know, companionship is important. Uh, you know, mental health has been a major issue. And I'm not trying to make light of your legislation, but I think you're restricting people's abilities to, um, you know, buy puppies. For example, on the Eastern Shore, Chesapeake Bay Retrievers are popular. Um, Labradors are popular. They're, they're big hunting dogs, uh, you know, finding a, a, I, and my, I, I love my Corgi. It's a like, like, fur baby is the, the exact phrase for it, but you don't find uh, people willing to breed Corgis in, uh, in Salisbury or the Eastern shore. You have to go. And so, so it, do you see where a bill like this restricts people's ability to find companionship through pets? There is nothing that would restrict your ability if you found a responsible breeder in Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, or California from selling you a corgi puppy. Um, and you'll still be able to do that. What you won't be able to do is purchase them through a broker because the brokers are the ones dealing with the puppy mills. But if you find a, and, and I'm guessing a responsible breeder is going to say to you, uh, Delegate Adams, love to sell you one of our corgi puppies, but we're not going to just sell it without meeting you because we want to know it's going to a safe home. And, but if they do, there's nothing to prevent you from buying it from them having it shipped here if they're willing to ship. But the bottom line is um, the mass breeders are the ones that are addressed in this bill because we are making a policy statement that we do not think in the 21st century that the cruelty that is occurring in order to produce these puppies is acceptable for purposes of convenience of owning a puppy. And maybe it's more convenient to be able to go online, uh, type in a credit card number and have what may be a sick or ailing puppy shipped to you um, and then find 
that, and, and you talked about paying $1,000, $1,500 for a puppy, go to look at just puppies and, and see what they're selling them for. $3,000, $4,000, almost $5,000 to get a sick or ailing puppy and then find out there's no warranty. So we are saying that there's two things in effect. One, our concerns about protecting consumers in Maryland from receiving ill puppies. And secondly, that we don't think it's an appropriate policy to allow the breeding dogs to suffer in order to have a profit for this industry. So I'm sort of back to it, Senator, I'm, I'm back to a sure. principle, which is consumers access to companionship through pets. This is a different issue than going to a Target or to a Walmart. We're talking about somebody who, who wants companionship. And so having to travel to Pennsylvania is easy for me. The, the other question I have for you is that uh, the kennels, you know, are they regulated? There are some regulations in state law with regard to numbers of breeding facilities, and most of it, I believe, is done at the local level under state law, but it requires uh, local licensing uh, based on the number of breeding dogs that may that there may be. So I've been told that the uh, the, the definition of a kennel is the same as a retail pet store in some of these counties. Is that true? And how do you parse out uh, kennel and retail pet store when the county local definition is the same? This is governed by state law, and we have a very clear definition in state law as to what a retail pet store is. So, okay, so you're, you're governed by state law. So, so in one run respect, you're saying a kennel is not regulated or it's regulated locally. You're saying this bill... No, I'm saying my recollection is that there are state laws regulating kennels, but I believe a lot of the licensing is done through local governments. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, there are state laws that uh, that do apply. I'll stick with my original, um, you know, and this, I'm not going to ask any more questions. Just say to you that, you know, a bill like this where we're banning a, a retail practice, um, you know, a regulated retail practice has unintended consequences. I think that goes without saying. I, th these bills in the past have not been bills that I've shown a great deal of support for, primarily because at the end of the day, consumers have a right to, you know, buy things. It, it's also the state's right to regulate, but, you know, simply banning it, um, I think you, you're asking a whole lot of the, the committee. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. I have... Uh... For, for uh, the wish to ask questions, uh, delegate in order: Delegate Brooks, Delegate Rogers, Delegate Crosby, Delegate Howard, and okay. then Delegate Wilson. Right. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, my friend Ben, thanks. Thanks for your your bill. Hey, cool. quick question: I, I went to the BB uh, BB uh, Better Business Bureau BBB. And I saw that they, there were like twelve thousand complaints, and um, I think they said. Uh, uh, I mean, 12,000 reviews, and I think there were 90 com uh, complaints that they say, and that was 0.075% uh, of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the, the total number of complaints. And the second part of that, uh, the, uh, it says that they were authorized by the a AKC, that's the American Kennel Club. What, what does that, that mean? I mean, does, does that validate the uh, uh, puppy spot or what? No, the American Kennel Club will provide, um, in other words, if I, I believe it's, I, you know what, I don't recall. There was a time when I knew what you had to pay per puppy to uh, get a uh, certificate from the American Kennel Club. Mm -hmm. um, and the American Kennel Club has been complicit uh, for years with the, the puppy mill industry because they generate literally millions of dollars from the puppy mills because what you will get is a certificate that you pay for and it gives the impression that this dog uh, somehow has healthy lineage 
And in fact, as I indicated in that one complaint I read, here's a person who, when they got it, discovered that lineage showed multiple inbreeding of the parents. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, um, I do rescues, I, I do adopted rescues. And uh, my most recent adopted rescue is a Doberman. And uh, the rescue agency was able to get the original AKC, which went straight to a Missouri puppy mill, which is where this, it, and he's a sweet loving dog, but I guarantee you with all of his health issues and appearance, he would never meet any standards uh, of the breed. Uh, doesn't mean he isn't sweet, he isn't loving. It means he's very expensive because he has specific medical needs. And, uh, and I'm okay with doing that. Um, but he came straight out of a Missouri puppy mill and Missouri is one of the, uh, the states that is the largest uh, that produces puppy mills. They are huge in the industry. Right. And quickly, Mr. Chair, just one more. And, and I, 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 the ASPC uh, defines a puppy mill as a, 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 say, a, a high volume puppy industry where they say breeders primarily deals with one breed and they belong to a, a, an association of, of, of breeder clubs so i guess that's that would be what you would you would agree with that so that's what the major difference between it is. and and yes yeah, so the kennels that you will find the legitimate breeders the quality breeders typically breed a single breed of dog the puppy mills they may have 30 different breeds of dogs at any given time um, breeding them every cycle. The females are bred every heat cycle until they die. They oh. live in a cage being forced to breed. And you may have a German shepherd dog with a collie stacked on top of it and a poodle stacked above it, all breeding every cycle. And that's what the puppy mills are. And uh, that's the way they conduct their business. And you know, my point to Delegate Adams is that, yes, this bill is a policy statement that we just don't think that because consumers should have, you know, the option to buy whatever they want, wherever they want, that we should be willing participants in this cruel and ugly industry. And it's a, it's a policy statement. And we, we took the first step in 2018 and this is the second step. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, Delegate Rogers. Hey, good afternoon, Senator Kramer. Uh, with Hi, Delegate. Pleasure. And I'm trying to figure out if there is a distinction, and, and maybe you can help clear it up for me, between a, a broker and a breeder, and, and if there's some sort of regulatory um, policies or regulations in place for the distinction between the two? And secondly, um, how would your bill impact um, working dogs or service dogs? Or are they part of this as well? Okay, the answer to the last question is no, working and service dogs are not affected in any way, shape or form. And under the bill, because yes, the breeder, there's actually definitions in the bill um, breeder, as defined in the bill, means a person who breeds or raises dogs or cats to sell, exchange, or otherwise transfer to the public. Broker means a person who transfers dogs or cats for resale by another person. So that's what these brokers do, these um, uh, that, that set up at, at these websites. Um, most of them have uh, a broker's license and they're the in-between, the go-between. Um, and that's the way they had traditionally operated store, puppy mill, broker in between the two. Now the brokers through, uh, by virtue of the internet, um, have set up these websites and, uh, and then, you know, they'll have a puppy mill in Missouri or a puppy mill in Ohio uh, in fact, puppy mills all over the country, um, they'll put up pictures of a golden retriever. And if somebody wants a golden retriever, they go to the puppy mill in Missouri, 
and it will be shipped directly from the puppy mill. The, the puppies are not, and they give the impression that these cute little puppies are laying there at the, the feet of the people who answer the phone. Um, but the fact of the matter is they don't touch the puppies. They, they're the in-between. You put your credit card in, you pay them $4,000. They go to the puppy mill that they're paying $500 for the puppy to, and then have it shipped to you. So, so the brokers are the in-between folks. So under your bill, and I guess this goes back to Delegate Adams' question, if I wanted my Yorkshire Terrier, I would have to go to a family, a kennel, or a breeder. Those are my options. Well, you could go to any breeder. There's nothing, look, you could buy directly from a puppy mill under the bill. There's nothing that would stop you from buying directly from a puppy mill if you choose to do so. Um, you, you'll, you'll be able to buy from any source that you choose that is a breeder. You just won't be able to buy from a broker. So it, it'll be the, that in-between person. And I, I do want that to be clear at the end of the day. Anybody that wants to buy, you know, if there's a big Missouri uh, puppy mill and you decided they've got a puppy you want, you'll still be able to buy directly from them. They can ship to you. Um, that doesn't change. We're taking out of the equation those middle people um, who are the in-between, the brokers. But you can buy from any breeder that you choose, regardless of size, scale. Um, you know, certainly... Our small businesses, our local businesses, I'm guessing, uh, will hopefully benefit because if you want that golden retriever, you may go to, and all of our counties have lots of kennels and breeders in them, some of them, you know, hundreds, and, you know, hopefully they'll be beneficiaries and you'll go to, uh, you know, golden retrievers of Timonium. Or, uh, or poodles of Salisbury. And, uh, and then our local economy and our mom and pop businesses benefit. Okay, thank you. I do it this year. Thank you for the question. Uh, Delegate Crosby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And it's good to see you, Senator Kramer. Just a quick, has this ever been enacted in another state, a similar policy? The first part was, and Maryland was one of the first states to enact the prohibition on retail pet stores. And now other jurisdictions, and I believe several, I, I believe there are a number of states now that have also followed uh, those actions. But this would be, again, make Maryland in the forefront on the second prong that we are addressing with this legislation. So and in do, sorry. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, in doing so, is there any question or concern about the Commerce Clause, and has the AG weighed in on that? Because I supported this last year, but I hadn't really thought of that issue before now. Well, actually, the way the bill was originally introduced last year, um, there were some Commerce Clause issues or concerns that were brought up because it involved, uh, the language involved internet sales. So working closely with the attorney general's office, all of that went away. The bill was completely redrafted. There should be no commerce clause issues whatsoever. And uh, the, the bill should be in a fine posture. Um, I mean, it doesn't mean that the industry is not gonna file suit. The, the industry has filed suit about the bill that passed in 2018 in federal court and the federal court threw it out uh, last year. Um, I believe that the industry has appealed it and it just is languishing out there. But uh, the federal court made it very clear that Maryland was on solid footing in what we did in 2018, that it was a policy that dealt with both public health, public welfare, safety, and uh, animal welfare, and that the state was well within its ability to take those actions. Right. So I guess I guess my the, there's a slight distinction, right? Is that 2018 that bill was challenged, and they said that we were okay there, but this is a different bill and taking sure. a step. So has the AG? I don't see the AG weighing in on this. Have, have they given it or provided an opinion? And maybe I just don't see it. 
I did not after last year, and the bill before it was <clears throat> identical to the way it passed out of the Senate and your committee last year. After it was completely revised into the posture that it's in, I don't think, it, I, I did not go back to the Attorney General's office because they were the ones who walked through the concerns with the bill the way it came in. They were very familiar with the way that the bill was revised and did not express any concerns with the language as it was revised. So I did not okay. go back again and ask for anything further from them um, after the bill was revised. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Sure. Delegate Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator, uh, good afternoon. Um, I have a few comments and then a, a brief question. Obviously, the Commerce Clause was one of the first questions I had, but obviously that hasn't been answered, so we'll move on. Um, secondly, a comment about uh, the access to dogs. Um, been trying to find a child, no dice. Unless I want to drive two states away, it's very difficult according to the design you discussed. Um, and the, the worry that I have is, and what I'd love to know in a short sentence, if you can do it, what is your final goal? Because, and I mean that because we come back every year with these continuation of puppy bills, which is fine, I get it. But sometimes it'd be great to know just what the end result is supposed to be. Because if it's like cruelty, again, if we're trying to get rid of cruelty against dogs, that's how we've created most of these breeds. To be very honest with you, you can't cross the dogs that we've crossed the, to make the breeds that we've made without extreme cruelty gambling to make sure that the, half of them didn't make it. So what is your exact goal, knowing that cruelty is kind of how we've created most of these breeds of dogs? Well, listen, I'm not going to take issue at whatsoever with your concerns about breeding practices and how dogs have been bred to breed in this characteristic or that characteristic. That's for, you know, others who there are some who think it's wonderful, others who you know, are going to say, why are we doing that? Um, but we do that across the board. We do it with horses and we race horses. And listen, you, um, you know, I'm not going to take issue with your statement on that. Uh, the goal here, though, to your point, and, and I stated this back in 2018, um, when the bill first came into this committee, was that there were two parts to this. And the first was, you know, to, to, to try to minimize, minimize um, what we are exposing our consumers to in the way of these puppy mill products and to uh, do our best to push back on the industry and its cruelty. And the first part was, look, retail pet stores. That's the first piece. The second piece was going to be these brokers who now have adopted this practice of selling by the thousands, uh, you know, the puppy mill products on uh, the, their websites. So- uh, Is there a third? That's what I'm worried about, the third and the fourth piece. Look, the, you know, this is, uh, I'll be the first one to acknowledge that this industry, because the profits are huge. Uh -huh. Delegate Wilson, the profits are in the hundreds of millions. Yes. So this industry is going to do everything it can to thrive and survive, which is why, you know, the notion of opening the door and allowing humane practices to be a policy and to start governing thought process is horrifying for them. But I'm not aware of additional policies at the moment. But, you know, look, it's a moving target and the industry will, you know, and I guarantee you. They're going to find other angles to take, and they're going to try to find other ways. And, you know, the, the I, I think we will continue to do the best we can to, you know, move as necessary. Um, but this is really the, you know, the, the second part that I, I brought out in 2018. Well, um, Senator, uh, you know, I, I appreciate your economy of words as always. But um, I just wanted to say that because that's the worry is just, you know, where we're going, how far we're going to go, as I've laid out. And just lastly, a comment is the I do have a worry about access, because, again, for those that can't that have some money, want some companionship. And believe me, a rescue dog is no joke. And I know, you know, we don't have a guarantee with these uh, um, these uh, puppy mills. 
But man, you go to get, I've, I've spent thousands of dollars trying to keep a rescue dog alive. And I think a lot of times people have a difficulty doing that. They'd rather try to get a pure breed as cheaply as possible than to drive to, I don't know, Wisconsin or to um, rescue a, a dog that may or may not have a hereditary mange, which will never go away. So I just have some concerns with, you know, the direction we're taking and access for those who don't have the financial resources to properly care for dogs such that, that you like you do. Thank you. Well, and, and, and uh, you know, once again, just to clarify for the committee, and I hope this is very clear, the bill would not prevent you from buying, um, what was it, a chow you said? Was that the, the breed? To, to, to buy a chow three states over and have it shipped to you. This bill does not prohibit that. Um, this bill will just prevent dealing with the, the brokers dealing into Maryland, not the breeders. You can buy from any breeder. And like I said, you can even buy from the puppy mills. They're breeders. So if you find one in Missouri you like, you'll be able to buy from them. But the likelihood of people getting sick and, uh, 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 and puppies where there is no warranty, where the warranty explicitly states there's no warranty. And by the way, no warranty as to anything about what you receive. And by the way, immediately following their warranty disclaimer, they have on the next paragraph is no cash refunds. You cannot get back your money no matter what. So that's who we're dealing with. This is about consumer protections. It's not to say you may buy, you know, from a, if you find a breeder you like in, in Ohio to buy a chow, um, that breeder may say, hey, listen, you buy it, it's sold. I'm not gonna make uh, any warranties, but at least you can learn a little something about the breeder too. And you can find out whether the breeder's doing a good job, if they're a good breeder. Um, and then say, okay, this is where I want my chow from. You don't have to get out of your seat. You can still order it on, you know, online, over the phone. Um, there's nothing that will prohibit the purchase from a breeder. And Senator, I will say, as always, thank you very much. And your brevity is always breathtaking. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Wilson. Always a pleasure. All righty. Let me go on to our witness list now. We'll start with Sarah Yassin. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Davis, Madam uh, Vice Chair Dumay, and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Yassin, and I'm a Maryland team re leader for Bailing Out Benji. We are a national nonprofit that researches and investigates the commercial dog industry. Um, my colleague and president will be speaking to you shortly, but I'm testifying in support of this bill. The No More Puppy and Kitten Mills Act of 2018 was passed and signed by Governor Hogan and went into effect January 1st of 2020. I've been monitoring the pets, the Maryland pet stores since that day on January 1st, um, 2020. The pet stores did close down, but only in anticipation of their lawsuit that they, along with a not notorious puppy mill broker and a Missouri puppy miller filed in federal court. They claim the act violated the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution. I went to Baltimore in February of 2020 and, and listened to a two day hearing in federal court before Judge Ellen Hollander. Um, <clears throat> Judge, Hall, sorry, Judge Hollander rejected their argument and dismissed their lawsuit. She held that the state of Maryland did in fact have a compelling interest to protect consumers, reduce the financial support for mill breeders and to encourage pet adoptions in passing the Puppy Mill Act. Um, so after the opinion was given, the pet stores were still not complying to our law. Um, as Senator Kramer mentioned, Presently, they are open to the public by appointment, and they're still selling puppy mill puppies to the consumers. Um, when I go to their website, I can still purchase a puppy from them. So, so I just want, you know, the courts have spoken, localities have spoken, um, many animal advocates and citizens have spoken. So let's just finish this business and pass this in 2021. And I ask for a favorable report, and I thank Senator Kramer for its sponsorship. I got it just in time. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much. 
Um, Mindy Callison. I'm here. Thank you, Chairman Davis and committee members. My name is Mindy Callison and I'm the founder and executive director of Bailing Out Benji. What I do is research and investigate the commercial breeding industry as it relates to companion animal sales to pet stores and online consumers. The information that I'm sharing today can be independently verified by obtaining records from the Department of Ag. I wanna to speak to the, about the dog brokering world and the lack of transparency that exists for the consumer. Our research has recently connected one Maryland store as being owned by a two-time horrible hundred puppy mill broker in Ohio. This facility also operates a sham rescue and nonprofit to sell the same commercially bred puppies as rescues and a clear act of consumer fraud. The puppy laundering scheme is a nationwide effort started by dog brokers in order to skirt local and state laws. Both California and Iowa have cracked down on these sham businesses, but it's happening here in Maryland as well. Due to our research, we uncovered that the owner of Maryland Puppies Online, located in Bel Air, also operate Little Puppies Online out of Mount Vernon, Ohio, and Dogs to the Rescue out of Ohio. Due to their ongoing federal violations, this facility has been named one of the worst puppy mills in the country twice, but that isn't stopping them from operating brokering websites in at least five different states, like here in Maryland. From the business side, these stores and brokering websites, such as Puppy Spot, use online ordering systems like Amazon to add puppies and kittens to their cart and have them shipped to their business or customers for resale. These transactions are all done online with little to no verification that the breeding facilities are humane and without violation. Through every step of the puppy ordering, buying, and reselling business, there is a concerning lack of transparency. The consumers buying these puppies have no way of knowing for sure where their puppy was born until after purchase. Thank you so much for hearing my testimony today. And I believe that SB 103 would help the consumers in Maryland. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Radoff. Chairman Davis, Chairman Dumay, members of the Economic Matters Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Lisa Radoff. I'm the president and chairman of Maryland Votes for Animals here in support of SB 103. On a lighter note, happy National Puppy Day. Um, as you know, Maryland passed historic legislation with this committee at the forefront, um, helping that happen. Um, although, and as you've heard today, there are some abuses that China. are still happening. Um, this bill closes loopholes in the 2018 law to stop the flow of puppies and kittens from out-of-state puppy mills. We want to ensure that Marylanders are not inadvertently supporting a cruel industry that treats puppies and kittens like inventory and not our best friends. Let's continue to keep Maryland a state that says no to profiting from puppy mills. I'd like to thank Senator Kramer for his sponsorship of SB 103 and urge a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions for any of these ladies, uh, Delegate Arendt? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Lisa. Good to have you. Good to see you again. Lisa, something that concerns me, and I'm going to ask the puppy, uh, puppy, whatever the name of the company is, uh, Senator Kramer was referring, what standards are in place for breeders? Um, well, there are standards. And, and that, well, before you go too far, I'm going to, I'm going to ask, that's different from what they would be for the puppy mill. Well, it depends on how they're regulated. Um, I'm not an expert or a lawyer in this respect, but I assume that the puppy mills operating out of state would be regulated by their own state's laws, as opposed to breeders who are in Maryland, which this law says that the uh, dog and the owner of the dog and the person buying the dog have to be in the same place when the transaction is taking place. Okay. so. But when I go to Puppy Spot and ask the, the same question, I'll get their answer and I'll hopefully I'll get a, a comparison between those two. Yes, okay. I, do, I do just want to mention as much as we are regulating, and I understand the questions about the Commerce Clause, um, just also do want to put a little bit of a promotion in for Adopt, Don't Shop, that um, that is a very good way and um, successful way that people do adopt uh, dogs and cats, puppies and kittens into loving homes. I, you know, my personal experience, I've had two labs, I've had several dogs, but I've had two labs where I got from the same breeder in state. And the one had dysplasia of the elbows, the other one had cancer. 
And, and I do know that we try to do the right thing and we try to keep everything proper. I just, I just don't know how much somebody's doing. And that's why I'll ask them a similar question. But thank you so much. I appreciate all you do. Thank you, Delegate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, did I miss anyone else that would like to ask a question? If not, let me go to the opponents now, Robert Likens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Bob Likens uh, from Woodbine, Maryland. I'm speaking on behalf of the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council. We're the largest trade association uh, for the broad uh, responsible pet trade in the U.S. Um, others uh, are going to speak, I'm sure, about the, uh, the national shortage of dogs that exists right now and the simple fact that the rescue shelters and these small breeders can't meet that demand, which will result in lower breeding standards, higher prices, a lack of choice, and inevitably black market development. With regard to this specific bill, the, the big challenge is that it eliminates access to the best qualified and uh, regulated breeders. It bans the use of the best qualified and, and regulated transporters. It requires purchasers and breeders to ignore social distancing guidelines, which it's much easier for for a retail establishment to maintain than someone's home to maintain when you're bringing outsiders in. And it means that only those who can personally drive long distances can go to find the, the breed that best fits their lifestyle and, uh, and situation. Um, I mean, Senator Kramer did speak to, the, um, to being able to use uh, breeders that weren't local, but right in the bill, a completed sale, transfer, or disposition of a cat or dog is conducted in person with both parties physically present at the same location. So if you want that dog that he was speaking about in California, you have to go to California and get that dog. Um, there, are, there are all kinds of issues with this legally, but the biggest challenge with this bill is just that it does so much to cut access to the right breed for your situation. Uh, it makes it extremely difficult for someone who can't just jump in the car and drive to Pennsylvania or Wisconsin. Uh, with that, I would request that the, uh, the committee uh, report this bill unfavorably and thank you very much for your time. Uh, John Strategies. Uh, well, I think that's me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Dr. John Goldberg. Uh, I live in Davidsonville, Maryland, along with my three dogs and three cats. Following 23 years service as chief scientist on the Committee on Agriculture in the U.S. House of Representatives, I left public service and now consult on issues including animal health and welfare. In 2016, I was asked by Puppy Spot to conduct an independent evaluation of their standards for breeder performance. Following the process I outlined in my written testimony, we ultimately established a set of health and welfare standards that meet or exceed any applicable government or private sector standards. These standards don't just prohibit Puppy Spot from working with puppy mills, they actually ensure Puppy Spot is working with the best of the best. Access to puppies has come up in this hearing uh, earlier, so let me provide you a few numbers. According to the Shelter Animal Count, which is a national database supported by the Humane Society and ASPCA, Maryland shelters took in 19,466 dogs in 2020, of which 4,106 were returned to their owners, 1,638 were euthanized. This left approximately 13,722 available for adoption. Contrast this with the annual demand in Maryland for more than 79,000 dogs, and you see that shelters can only provide approximately 17% of the puppies your constituents demand. As far as breeders, I actually just looked this up while uh, Senator Kramer was speaking. There are only 10 USDA licensed breeders in the entire state of Maryland, so I don't think limiting options to just those nearby breeders will work for most Marylanders. The bill before you, if it enacted, would leave Marylanders few legal options to find dogs for their families. I don't think this is your intent. A fair, unbiased evaluation of what many in the industry are currently doing will convince you that SB 103 is not the answer, but it's an accident waiting to happen. 
A better alternative is to review applicable industry and government standards to ensure that consumers have access to puppies from breeders, dealers, and others that fully comply with rigorous science-based standards, such as those established by Puppy Spot. Thank you. I look forward to answering any questions you have. Thank you very much. Josh Kreinberg. Hi. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Chairman Davis uh, and the members of the Economic Matters Committee for allowing me to speak here. Um, I'm Josh Kreinberg. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer and uh, General Counsel of Puppy Spot. Uh, I'd prepared some remarks um, and you have my written testimony, so uh, please look at that. I feel after listening to this for the third time around as Senator Kramer continues to disparage my company um, without even ever agreeing to speak with me or come and visit. You want transparency. I've offered multiple times to have them come and visit our breeders. I'll extend the same offer to you guys. I would really, really appreciate it if we, as we evaluate uh, important things like this, we look to facts and, and what's actually out there. It's really essential. Um, I agree with Senator Kramer that puppy mills are abhorrent. That's why we do not work with them full stop. I think we should continue um, to actually get to the bottom of this and not go off of Senator Kramer, who says, don't listen to him. Don't take his word for it. Investigate it. Let's do that. Um, he always talks about guessing and believing, but let's come out and see the breeders. He can't define puppy mill. He talks about it involving these multiple uh, stacked crates of various dogs or something as a definition. We don't have that. Our standards don't allow that. And we check our breeders and make sure they're not doing that. He talks about commission sales. Commission sales would be no good for us. We do not just pay people on commission because we commit to rehome and take care of any dog we place. I personally have to do that. So that would be stupidity of us just to do that. We don't do it. And so it'd be great if we could actually delve into what the facts are. We want to look at our actual reviews. The platform that he besmirches and claims that it's nothing is on our website is run by a third party service. We have an A plus rating with the BBB for our responsiveness to customers. We ask that you really evaluate this if you're going to pass legislation. And let's Let's make it science-based. And I really agree with the, with the goal. Let's work on something that works. Thank you very much. Uh, Rebecca Schmidt. Hi, yes. So my name is Becky Schmidt. I'm the manager of Charm City Puppies. I've been with the store since we opened in 2012 and in the industry for 14 years. I'd first like to share about our breeders. Our breeders are licensed, they're inspected, they're regulated. They're breeders that I've worked with for years. I've been to their kennels. I know their dogs and I'm really proud of the work that they do. Proponents of this bill have made vicious claims against our breeders and they're simply not true. Um, they don't know our breeders. They've never visited our breeders, our stores. Um, and they're serving an extremist agenda, and that's to stop breeding. Our stores offer quality puppies from good breeders to our customers with full transparency and also consumer protections. Before passing a bill like this, I want you to ask yourself where you will get your next puppy when stores like ours no longer exist. I have a couple options. Uh, one, you can order your puppy online, sight unseen. You'll run the risk of being scammed out of your hard-earned money. If you receive a puppy, will it be healthy? And if you don't, will it have, will you have any remedies? And I'm not talking about a, you know, reputable online broker like Puppy Spot. I'm talking about Craigslist <coughs> and Becky's Bichon Palace and, and places like that. Option two, you could get your dog from a rescue or shelter. It's really not a comparable option because most likely you're not getting a puppy and you're definitely not getting a purebred puppy. Um, your next option would be going to a backyard breeder. Those are the type of breeders, the, you know, mom and pop breeders, if you will, that's a big portion of them. They're unlicensed, they're unregulated, they're not subject to any inspections. They don't follow the same animal husbandry practices that a quality professional breeder would, and uh, they don't do health testing, no consumer protections. Um, that's a big piece of it. The other mom and pops are, um, you know, the hobby breeders, like we said, they can never meet the demand if you can get on their waiting list. And traveling is the other option, which isn't an option for a lot of Maryland consumers. And with that, then you are making the determination, is that a good breeder um, that you're going to go travel for, if that's even an option. I just believe that Marylanders deserve the right to purchase their next pet through a reliable, regulated, inspected source, and they shouldn't have to settle for 
a poorly bred dog or a breed they don't want because you know this bill's goal is to limit access. Thank you very much. Uh, as we go to uh, Ms. Halpern, uh, Madam Vice Chair, I need to take over. I have a required training I have to participate in, so I'll have to leave the committee at this point. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I, Dr. Nancy Halpern, represent the Pet Ownership Defense Alliance. And as the chair of the Animal Law Practice Group at Fox Rothschild, adjunct professor of animal law at Seton Hall, and formerly the highest ranking veterinarian in New Jersey, I have grave concerns about the pet store sourcing bans in SB 103 from an animal health and legal perspective and therefore oppose the bill. As the New Jersey state vet, I protected animals impacted by disasters and observed the beginning of the retail rescue movement following Hurricane Katrina. What started as a humanitarian effort has become a multi-million dollar unregulated industry. Concurrent with the passage of pet store sourcing bans, state and federal animal health officials observed the explosion of diseases spread through rescue channels like canine influenza and distemper. Marylanders were exposed to a positive rabies dog imported from Egypt with fraudulent paperwork by a rescue, resulting in numerous quarantines in four states and post-exposure rabies inoculations in 18 people. From a legal perspective, 103 violates at least the commerce, supremacy, contract, takings clauses of the Constitution. If it passes, pet stores that are allowed to showcase licensed and unlicensed breeders would no longer be exempt under the Animal Welfare Act since the seller would not be physically present in the store. And the breeder would have to become a USDA Class B dealer, which would ban them from selling dogs in other jurisdictions. You could require increased standards of care for dogs and breeder and broker facilities, but cannot simply eliminate validly licensed entities from conducting commerce within or between any state. If you are concerned about the health of dogs, as am I, I ask you to oppose this bill and seek laws that will stop illegal trafficking of sick, improperly bred dogs through rescue channels. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Halper. We'll go to questions now. Delegate Valderrama. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, I want, I was one, one part question, but after hearing the other um, opposition, I wanted Senator Kramer to respond to Mr. Is it Likens regarding accessibility? Uh, and then the other was, was it Mr. Kreinberg? All right, we don't usually do this where we go back to the proponents. Um, Proponents? Oh, the questions for the opponents. This this is for the opponents, Madam Vice Chair. You asked for Delegate Kramer, or so I'm sorry, Senator Kramer, to answer the question. Oh, I'm sorry. So I would like Mr. Likens, okay. to, um, who was the, uh, I believe he was. Yes, the, you're right. That's fine. Session. I thought you wanted Senator Kramer to answer. I apologize. Okay. So you made some commentary about access regarding the bill. So if you could speak to that, because I, I see the whole premise behind the piece of, leg of legislation. And then Mr. Kreinberg, you made some, I, I guess I'll call it allegations regarding the Senator's um, profile reputation as far as not communicating. Uh, I find that hard to believe that there was no communication that took place regarding this legislation. And then Ms. Schmidt, is it Schmidt? I wrote it down. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember the name of your company, but I believe in the earlier testimony there were a number of companies that were named that are operating illegally. And it's my understanding based on your testimony, you're still operating illegally. Um, so if you guys could answer or comment on that in the order that I posed it, that would be. All right, Mr. Likens. Thank you, Delegate. I appreciate the question. Uh, what I was reading was um, line 26 of page three of the bill. Uh, it says that a retail pet store does not include an establishment which, and then the second uh, possible exception is an, establ an establishment at which a completed sale, transfer, or disposition of a cat or dog is conducted in person with both parties physically present at the same location. So, um, I, I just wanted to clarify because when Senator Kramer was describing the process, he was saying if you still wanted to use that broker in California, you could use that broker and have the animal shipped to you. Well, breeder. 
I'm sorry, Madam Green. Chair, Mr. Likens is completely misrepresenting my. Okay, that's all right. One at a time. And all he right. just and agreed with may... you. He meant breeder. No, I, yes, I meant breeder. Uh, but you would have to go to the breeder in California, conduct that transaction, and then ship the animal. If you're shipping the animal, you, you would use a responsible shipper, which would be a Class B dealer. Which... Madam Chair, may... he's completely misconstruing. Okay. That Senator Kramer, in fairness, you had your sh turn, and we're going to listen to the testimony, and we will, you know, then be. And it's completely erroneous. I just want to share that with the committee. All right, thank you. Thank you. I'm I, delegate. All, all I can do is read you the text of the actual bill, and it says you must be present at the same location. It, it absolutely does not. It says a retail pet store does not include a facility where this happens. It does not say that it's the only way you can purchase from a breeder, Mr. Likens. You are misreading the bill, which is not. All right. Well, Senator Kramer, we Thank have you, Madam Chair. all of us can, and I we've got staff that can. So we will get to the bottom of it. Um, Mr. Kreimer, did you want I to to Delegate Valderrama? Yes, yes. Thank you, Delegate Valderrama. Um, and thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, we've tried several times to reach out to Senator Kramer through uh, Brett Leininger at Old Vine, who has represented us. Um, he's refused to take any of those meetings. And um, I've extended the invitation as I'm extending today, because I think it's essential in something where, where there's this concern about what's happening, that there's not a bunch of guessing and believing that you can't come and see. I'm, I'm happy to take, take you on a tour of of breeders, I'd, I'd love to do that. I want, I, I agree with the principle of what we're trying to accomplish here. Nothing is more important to me. And it's what we try to accomplish on a daily basis by the standards that we uh, we impose and force all of our breeders, even, even small exempt breeders who have no other source of regulation on them. We force them to comply with our standards that were developed by our scientific advisory board and blessed by American Humane. Um, so we know that there are humane practices, which again, Senator Kramer says that that um, breeders don't engage in humane practices, um, breeders that operate through uh, companies like us. Um, we've got you know, literally a company with humane in the title, an organization that working to make sure that we have humane policies. Um, it's what we do. We do it all the time. And I really would welcome anyone to come on out and come, let's go, let's go meet some of the breeders. Let's see what it's really like rather than just articulating bands, et cetera, in a vacuum. Okay, Mr. Kreiner. Thank you. If you would um, kindly just, oh, I'm sorry. Nope, go ahead. I didn't realize you had a call if, that's fine. Uh, I didn't know I would either. Um, if you would kindly produce a list, whether it's just for me or for the committee, I don't know if the rest of the committee wants it, just a list of all your breeders that you mentioned just now in your response, that would be great. So we, our breeders are screened and vetted by us and it's a, it's a vetting service that we provide to customers. So we don't, we don't list our, our breeders for everybody else. So, uh, but I'm happy to arrange a visit. I'm happy to have go over the standards and the likes of that. Okay, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I find that a little odd that that is not being off let that you can't provide that just for more clear, you know, well, it, it's the core of it's the core of our business, right? So if we start providing it, it starts to become accessible to something that's like a FOIA request or otherwise, then we wind up at that point having worked really hard as a screening service, and that's all we become. So people just use us because we do work really hard. We develop really high standards and we administer them. And if they wind up getting out there just as a process to screen and find good breeders and then not operate through us after we've, if we've spent all of that money to go ahead and do that exercise, um, it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make a business that that's successful in any way, shape or form. Um, it's core to what we do. Um, you know, many would liken it to a trade secret um, as far as how that works. I'm Madam Chair. All right, thank you, um, Vice Chair. I'm sorry, who's asking? Oh, that'll get Brooks. <laughs> Um, hey. Your hand's not up yet. And oh, there yeah. are several For some reason or the other, my hand is not working. Maybe I okay. can. 
All right. Well, I will get to you, but there were a few in front of you. Okay. And I think um, Delicate Valderrama had a question for Ms. Schmidt. Hi, yes. Could you repeat your question for me? I was asking why you're still operating illegally. Uh, so we're not operating illegally. We are not open to the public. So we're showcasing puppies only by appointment. Um, and we have been working with the attorney general's office to provide them all of the information that they've asked for because um, they are gathering information to determine if we are operating legally or not. But it's my understanding that we're operating legally by appointment only. Okay, you'll forgive me if I say just because it's online does not mean you're not operating, but all right. It, it was, off. But it's all right. my understanding based on the testimony earlier that it's illegal. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. All right, Delegate Aarons. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Mr. Kleinberg, can you do me a favor? I asked uh, Ms. Radoff earlier. Can you tell me the standards and possibly how they differ from what we're doing in shelters currently that uh, Puppy Spot has? Can you describe that briefly? Sure. I'll be as brief as I can. So we created a scientific advisory board um, of which Dr. Goldberg, you heard him speak earlier. Um, we've got on him, uh, we have him on the board as well as uh, a number of uh, veterinarians, a shelter veterinarian, uh, former um, regulators. Um, so we created a set of a set of standards, which is not even applicable at all to, um, to shelters or rescues. Um, and those uh, standards are a superset of every other kind of set of standards we could find out there, uh, whether federal or state, um, or um, whether they're proposed by animal welfare organizations or whatnot. And then we field tested them um, by actually going out and visiting breeders to make sure that they work. And then we further tested them by, um, by seeing the dogs that come out of uh, kennels that wear uh, dogs have been raised and are treated according to these standards um, and reviewing them to further provide modifications. Um, so again, this is a whole set of standards, nothing the likes of which is applicable at all to a shelter or rescue. And as I was saying earlier, the smaller breeders that are out there operating in the world don't have any standards like this applicable or any at all because they're exempt from federal standards and, and the state standards are a patchwork on that too. One other thing, are you, do you do business or are you allowed to do business with any breeders in Maryland? We are allowed to do business with breeders in Maryland. Um, we have in the past done business with Maryland breeders. I don't believe that we currently have any uh, Maryland breeders that are active with us. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, right, Chair. Delegate Carey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is for Mr. Kreinberg. Uh, Mr. Kreinberg, I guess listening to all this, why does a customer need your service? Why? Why can't they just find and travel a dog themselves? Well, I think that I, I, I think it was Delegate uh, Adams who, who brought this up earlier um, and in response to kind of how he how his own search went uh, to find a, a dog in Pennsylvania or whatever. Um, so first off, there's the finding aspect. How do you find a, a, a dog? How do you how do you match with a breeder out there that's going to have the dog that you're interested in? Um, you know, Maryland, you know, it, it's a it's a great state. I lived in Baltimore for for a while, uh, but it doesn't have a lot of dog breeders there. It doesn't have a great access to dogs. And so you're going to want to go try to figure out how to get a dog. And so a service like ours, we do this screening aspect. We also verify the ads so that the, the picture that are coming up. We've gone back and forth with the breeder. We've validated the breed to the best of our standards um, in, that, in that manner. So you have some certainty in kind of what we're presenting and in the sourcing and finding and matching with the breeder. And the second piece is then if um, Delegate Adams is in his car and driving over to go check out the breeder, yes, congratulations. It's great. He's gone on site and he's been to the breeders. What the heck is he looking for? How does Delegate Adams know that he's found a good breeder or not a good breeder, that the dog's been raised well or any of that? That's what we do at the core of what we do is to help people do that. We spend all this time developing these standards, all this time applying this stuff so that we can help people do that. That's the, that's the basis of our service and that's what we're trying to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, Delegate mm -hmm. Howard. Yeah, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. To the CEO of B Spot, I looked on the Better Business Bureau. How many um, complaints do you have against you on BBB? 
Um, so first off, I'll point out I'm not the CEO. Yeah, no problem. Sorry, I had a bill uh, hearing, and then I had to ask some questions in one of my hearings. Uh, thank you, Delegate. Yeah. Yeah. Delegate Adams, can you mute yourself? Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, Josh, uh, Mr. Crump yeah. So, I, so just to make clear, I don't want to hold myself out as something I'm not. I'm the chief yes. administrative officer. Okay. Um, so, um, so I don't know how many complaints we currently have, but we do oh, have oh, 97. How many you do business in all 50 states? We do business and we don't do business in Hawaii, um, mm -hmm. but we do business otherwise in all of the 49 other states states okay so and how many puppies have you sold over the past i don't know year over the past year we've placed 25 uh 24 000 puppies i believe so twenty four thousand puppies 97 complaints and part of the warranty question that senator kramer brought up was there's a no cash refund warranty and one of the things i noticed on the complaints under the better business bureau was that you actively responded to each complaint offering services to provide to pay for vet, vet bills and things like that. Is that correct? Correct. We, um, we view our warranty as the baseline bottom uh, of what we would do. And we do go above and beyond to try to make sure that customers have the best possible experience. And the other piece that I will point out is that we are committed to finding forever homes for all of these dogs is we do not want to burden the shelter and rescue system. So we do have in our terms and conditions that if a customer ever feels like they're going to surrender a dog, that they need to bring that back to us. And again, I personally have been involved with almost every rehoming that we've done. And it's certainly um, something that we want to make sure is essential. So more than vet bills or anything else is making sure that the dogs are well taken care of forever. So you might not know this question, but as far as the other 49 states are concerned, uh, when you look at it in terms of market share and, and these are dogs and these are lives, and I don't want to look at it in strictly through that lens, but unfortunately that's the term we're going to have to use. When you look at it in terms of market share, what would you say that Maryland's market share is of, of puppy sales? Um, so, so based solely on our own puppy placements. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, so Maryland, we placed approximately 500 dogs last year, including okay. several dogs to Make-A-Wish children too, um, which um, we have a national partnership with Make-A-Wish. Um, so you're at about 2% of market share throughout the United States in Maryland. Correct. So if you lost the Maryland market, it really wouldn't mean much for you as far as dollars. Correct. So you're here strictly just to defend the nature of your business and quite frankly, your business reputation. Correct. Thank you, sir. Okay, Delegate Branch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was just listening at all this and uh, many of my questions were answered, but you said a moment ago that there was, uh, in terms of breeding, that you, you for breeds, you, 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 you judge that to the best of your, to your standards, to your best standards. What did you mean by that? Uh, sorry, so is that, the question is directed yeah, to me? I'm sorry. Yeah, to you, sir. Okay. Thank you very you much. You don't want Delia. to make the statement that, you know, yeah, so, the best way of your, your So you're talking about the, the standards in the context of the terms, photos and ads that we're reviewing, the brief you, standards, you, or you're talking? You, you responded to Delegate Valderrama that uh, in terms of breeding, you judge them to the best of your standards. So I want Got it. So, uh, so there's two, there are two pieces there that, that um, in the two slightly different contexts. One is as far as the, the raising of dogs, um, both from, from a health standpoint, from a humane treatment standpoint, from a behavioral standpoint, that we do according to the standards that were developed by our scientific advisory board in which they examined a, really a superset of all of the standards they could mm -hmm. find out there. Um, and um, in the context, uh, we've had a, a collaboration as well with, a, with an organization called American Humane, and they do the No Animals Were Harmed in Hollywood, um, you know, the making of this film. They run a number of farm certification programs. They run some, um, some disaster relief and rescue programs. Um, and so they also um, administer standards that, 
they took ours, they added their own. Um, and all these standards are designed to make sure that, you know, adult breeding dogs, as well as the puppies are being, you know, taken care of humanely and in a, in a very, in from a health standpoint, the best possible treatment. So those are the standards that we administer across our network. And again, we do them down to the breeder who is, you know, placing two dogs to the breeder who's placing many more. All of them have to comply with these standards. Um, the, the other standards that I, I was making reference to, too, is just the fact that when someone posts an ad, when one of our breeders wants to list one of their puppies and they, they post the ad in the description to, you know, to the website, we go through a process of where we review the ad and we're going over the description. We're contacting the breeder to the extent there are any discrepancies because we want to validate that and make sure that, that everything's clear to the customer as well. You, you have papers for for them as well? I mean, uh, if, I, if I purchase a puppy and I want it to be thoroughbred, uh, do you, you provide those kind of uh, papers so we, and warranties yeah. and stuff like that? So we collaborate with the American Kennel Club and, um, you know, what, what we do there, again, is, is much more than it sort of was described. Um, it, uh, it's an involved process where we're one of their, um, I believe we're their only online partner that they have. Um, and so we go through a validation process with them and they actually provide the paperwork for any, any dogs that are AKC registered. Again, like not, not all dogs are registered with the American Kennel Club though. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, Delegate Brooks, you've been patient, but it's your turn. Okay, thanks Madam Chair. <laughs> Yes, uh, uh, this question is for uh, Mr. Kreinberg. Uh, uh, Delegate Bob Roman had asked about your, your list, and um, and I was wondering, wouldn't sharing that that breeders list perhaps um, bolster or support your, your argument? You know. Um yeah, so it certainly would. I, I agree 100%. It would bolster the argument about transparency. But as I've as I've said before, you know. Again, while you know some people might not view this 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 screening service that we provide as something um, valuable for some reason, it is extremely valuable because that is the core core of our business. And so we have had um, we have a number of um, you know uh, third party groups that will contact us and say, "Hey, is this breeder in on your list?" Um, because they would like to go work with the breeder. So it. Again, the amount of effort we pour into screening and vetting the breeders, you know, we don't we don't share the list, uh, you know, outwardly. We are again, we are reviewed because we're licensed and subject to inspection and review by the um, by the USDA. So they come through and review um, review our breeders. But um, otherwise, again, it's a service that we're we're not in the business of just you know screening breeders so that other people can go work with them directly. It's something that we put a lot of time and effort and value. And I've described the, the process and money we invest to do that. And it's sort of the core of the core of a service that we provide. And so that's why we're very sensitive about the full list. Now, once a customer has engaged with the breeder and the dog is traveling home, then we, you know, we'll share all the, the, the breeder information and all of that stuff as well. Okay. okay. One other question. Uh, what, what would be your definition of, of a, uh, of a puppy mill versus a breeder? That's a really great question. So a puppy mill is a substandard um, uh, breeding uh, source of, of, of puppies that places profit above the welfare of the dogs. And we have seen um, in, 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 you know, because of the standards we apply, we have seen um, uh, breeding facilities um, of, of all sizes. You know, we've seen small, small at home hobby breeders who have been terrible and we've seen great small at home hobby breeders. We've seen large breeders that, that do it the right way. They'll have their whole family involved in the kennel. They will be um, you know, handling dogs all the time. They'll take puppies out and play with them. They'll take the adult dogs out and, and, and walk them on leashes. There's a variety of things that are, that are determinative really of you know, what, you know, what is good animal husbandry versus um, just some of these other arbitrary things. And the, you'll see a million different 
uh, proposed definitions of puppy mills, but that's the one that, that, that has really has teeth in it and is the truest and kind of to the, to the core of what it's all about. Okay. All right. So, so, and lastly, so, uh, so, uh, the ASPCA, ASPCA said that normally it, it, the definition of the breeder would, they would be dealing with one particular, uh, 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 you know, breed as opposed to a multiplicity of breeds. So, so your breeders, do you have any of them that's breeding a, a multi, a multiplicity of, of, of dogs or just specifically one? So I'm, I'm unfamiliar with that specific ASPCA definition, and that may very well be their, their definition. So we do have some breeders that deal with, with uh, a number of breeds and some breeders that deal with only one breed. And like I look the other reference, I've seen people do a great job with, with a number of breeds. If, as long as they have the right staffing, commitment, standards, facilities to, to do it. Um, and again, I've seen people do a terrible job with one breed of dogs. All right, thanks. Thanks, Madam Chair. Sure, Delegate Mutz. Uh, th thank you, Chairman. And um, I, I'll try to keep my questions uh, short. I know we've had a lot of information, but, uh, but Mr. Mr. Kreinberg, um, with regards to, to this bill, are, are you aware of, uh, is this, the terms that are in this bill, are they in law in any other state in the country right now? I, I actually think that uh, Senator Kramer did, um, did, a, did a good job of summing that up when that question was uh, kind of asked of him. Um, Maryland's at the, at the forefront, and this is sort of a, a whole new, territory. Um, there are a couple of other states that do have the retail, um, we call the, the retail pet store kind of brick and mortar um, uh, bans in place. Uh, I, I am actually a resident of California, which is one of those that, that does. Um, I'm unaware of any state that would stretch it kind of as broadly as um, the current language of this uh, bill stretches it. And I think, um, I think uh, uh, Nancy Halpern did a great job of pointing out that there are a number of concerns with kind of what that does. So, and, and other than um, like the AKC and best practices, kind of what you've been describing, is there any other regulation over this business model, whether it uh, be the model that you utilize or some of the other more questionable ones that, that have been discussed to, today? Is there any um, federal, uh, USDA, any type of governing body um, that has requirements for uh for the uh, breeding and, and the sale of, um, of dogs and, and cats. Don't forget the cats. Yes, we don't, don't forget the cats. I actually have three cats myself, um, uh, two rescue cats and one shelter cat. Um, so the, uh, the USDA is the, um, is the governing body that um, you know, has the national level um, governance uh, of the standards. There are, you know, um, a number of states that also apply their own state standards um, to these. Um, and as mentioned before, if, um, if a, uh, animals are going to be uh, American Kennel Club registered, you, you will have uh, American Kennel Club standards as well that will apply, um, apply to them. Um, and that's one of the things, again, like, as I've tried to explain, like, what we try to do is fill in the gaps so that we can also bring those standards down to every single breeder's level rather than kind of leave the, you know, the exemption because none of those other organizations, you know, um, uh, you know, can get all the way down to the uh, individual small breeder. And so that's what we try to do. And sometimes I get lost in the details when we get into all these issues. And so I understand correctly, um, I'm assuming that if this bill becomes law in Maryland, prohibit you from doing what you currently do or would it limit what you currently do? So I'm, I'm uncertain of the, um, of the impact of, of the legislation. It, keeps, uh, it has kind of evolved a bit from you know, the initial legislation a couple of years ago and from the, what's proposed now and, and you know, as it moves around. Um, as you know, was expressed earlier, um, you know, certainly we are operating in you know, 
um, 48 other states. Um, and so that is something that we certainly could continue to do. Um, I would have to kind of fully, you know, evaluate the impact if it were, you know, turned on in, and if it were in fact passed in Maryland. Okay. So you, so your testimony would be, you really couldn't answer specifically what the impact would be, but that it seems to me from your response, it would be a significant change to the way you do business in Maryland. I think it's a significant change to the way a lot of people do business um, in Maryland. And that's, again, why primarily why I'm speaking here is, um, again, it was been pointed out, Maryland is not a huge state for us altogether, even if it did kind of have a full impact. I just want to make sure that, you know, that I have lots of friends, relatives, folks that that live in Maryland, and I want to make sure that we do the right thing for trying to fight puppy mills. I believe in that 100%. And then we pass good law that will make sure that we are achieving the goals that are stated that we want to achieve, and that it's well-reasoned and thought out and not something that's rushed through without evaluation of the unintended consequences. Uh, thank you very much for taking my questions and, and for your testimony today. And Senator, it's great to see you. Okay. Um, I you. see no further questions from the committee, but I do have one. Um, Ms. Halpern, I have not had an opportunity to go through all of the written testimony that was submitted. Did you also submit written testimony? I did not. Okay. I'd be happy Could to you? do so after the fact, if that's permitted. Sure. I, I mean, not, you know, through the committee system, but you're can send it to me and I'll be happy to send it to um, whomever, but, or to the rest of the committee. Um, could you sort of articulate a little further on why you believe that the bill is written would violate the commerce contract and takings clause of the US constitution? Sure. Um, so the commerce clause would, is at risk or it would be a violation based on what the district court has determined the existing law means, which is what a court would do. But we, you know that's under appeal. Um, but they have identified the fact that there is no commerce clause violation in a part because people in Maryland can purchase dogs that are or cats that are showcased by the stores from any breeder anywhere. Um, so if that is the case, if there's, a, there's a, like this combination of commerce clause and supremacy clause, because that implicates the definitions of retail pet store and the exemption for retail pet store in um, the USDA Animal Welfare Act. And also I believe would require class A licensees who are breeders um, to become class B licensees who are dealers. And then those, those now dealers would be prevented from selling into jurisdictions that ban class B licensees like New York City. So I believe there's an extraterritorial reach based on this, this change in license status. And I also think that it, it, what, what, what the court didn't discuss, which I think is very relevant is that, that this bill and the existing bill upends entirely the regulated interstate and intrastate pet market that was passed by Congress and is enforced by USDA. Completely upends it. So it's not that just one business has to change its model or another, it upends the entire thing. And in fact, it's done so to such a great degree that that's why the retail rescue market has been able to thrive as, as it has in a totally unregulated way. Okay. So it, when you do send written testimony, would you um, also, were you the, an attorney involved in the um, challenge of the Maryland law? No, I was not. Uh, I was, I'll, I'll find the court case by, myself, but, but feel free to send your written testimony to me. I'll be happy to share it. As far as the contracts and takings clause that you oh, asked sorry. about. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yep. Um, so depending on what the state were to determine, and, and if the state were to determine that the pet stores can now no longer wholesale these 
these dogs from all breeders. That also is now a violation of the Commerce Clause because it's not saved as the district court said it was. Um, but they also would be unable to continue to do business. Um, they can't compete with Chewy and all the other big box stores and everybody recognizes that more and more now in COVID, I think. Um, and so they, they all have contracts. They have their leased businesses. So that would be a violation of the contracts clause. And then it would be a taking because you're taking away their business. So um, there would be some remuneration and that might be under both state and federal law. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all of you for being here to testify. Um, I think this was a good um, robust discussion and that now concludes the testimony for ECM today and Delegate Wilson, I think he's on. Um, there is a business regulation subcommittee meeting within the next few minutes. Yes, please guys, I apologize. I tried to cancel it, Laura wouldn't let me. So um, Yay. log back on. Thanks, okay, guys. all right, well, thank everybody. Go enjoy some of the nice weather.